Hey Rosebank, well I'm here in my wife's art studio which is now a film studio recording a sermon. I've got to tell you that uh, this was not in preaching class. Uh, I've kind of been saying this a little bit so if you've heard me say it already just it's still just so real to me you know as pastors we we kind of have this saying where after we've preached if we feel like it didn't go well or maybe it didn't seem like people responded the way that we had hoped uh, we'll say things like man it felt like I was preaching to the walls well I've got to say right now I am literally preaching to the walls um, and I guess more than ever it just reminds me that you know um, it is God's Holy Spirit who transfers the message uh, from his word into our hearts no matter how that's transported whether in person or by a camera it's the holy spirit who does that work and so i'm just going to trust in that um as you as you listen to the sermon and i guess even, even more so going to trust in that today because uh topic for today um, is quite difficult. We're really going to need the Holy Spirit to apply that to our hearts. It's not as heavy as last week, I don't think, uh, but I do think that it still hits uh, quite close to home. So if you're able to cuddle up, uh, you might want to do that. So we're in week three of our Easter themed series called But Why? Uh, exploring why the crucifixion event happened and why it happened the way that it happened. And today we're going to see that the cross was necessary in order for our sins to be forgiven. And to uh, look at that, we're going to turn to Colossians 2. So turn there and read with me Colossians 2 verse 13 to 14. And it says, And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it, to the cross. Now I think that that passage is structured quite easily and it starts out with that idea that is just so powerful and you who were dead God made alive and I think that's one of these phrases that has become so familiar to us in Christianity that it may have lost its impact a little bit. You who were dead God made alive. In other words, we were lifeless in a box surrounded by darkness, worthless. We were dead, but God made us alive. I mean, that's a dramatic picture. Notice as well, but God made us alive. He did it. Last time I checked, dead people were not really able to accomplish very much much less make themselves alive. But God made us alive. Such a phenomenal picture of the transformation that happens in a Christian life. But the next part is really important because it describes how God made us alive from death. And it says this, having forgiven us all our trespasses, so the idea of forgiveness is central or seen as the cause. That's how God made us alive from dead is he forgave us all of our trespasses. So the idea of forgiveness is central to the idea of being made alive. Now we as Christians, I think we know that the forgiveness of sins is at the center of Christianity. But I just wanted to remind you of that since I have the opportunity and so I want to read to you from Acts 26, verse 18. So this is Paul before King Agrippa kind of sharing the gospel and talking about the time where God sent him to proclaim the gospel. And this is what he says in verse 18, that God sent him to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins 
and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me, Jesus says. I just think that's such a great summary. You want to tell somebody, well, what, what's the benefit of Christianity? Well, here it is. Eyes being opened, turned from living in darkness to light, from living under the power of Satan to under the power of God, having all your sins forgiven, and having a place among those who are being transformed. Isn't that a phenomenal description of the benefits of the Christian life? And central to it is having all of our sins forgiven. Now, in the next part of that verse, Paul takes this even further. And this really gets us to the heart of but why today, because it describes how forgiveness of sins is possible. So the way that you could narrate this text is you could say something like this. God made us alive from dead. Wow, amazing. But how did he do that? Well, he did that by forgiving us our sins. Sure. But how? How did he forgive us our sins? How is that possible? And that's where the next part of this verse comes in. Now, verse 14. He did that by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside by nailing it to the cross. So why was the cross necessary? Well, to cancel our debt so that our sins could be forgiven, so that we could be made alive from dead. Okay, so now we're going to have to do a little bit of, of thinking. And hey, I mean, I mean, at this point, benefit of doing church at home is you could just you could just switch off. And at this point, that would be okay. Because already, you, you have so much. This answer, but why? To cancel the record of debt. So that our sins could be forgiven. So that all of these marvelous things in Christianity could be made available to you. That's true. That's amazing. Maybe that even impacts your life, even right now. But if you really want to get the impact of what forgiveness of sins means and what the cross meant in accomplishing that, then we're going to have to try and understand this a little bit. And, that, and that's really what I'm all about, just helping us understand. And that's what the series is about. But why? Let's ask these questions. How does this, if the action on the cross, the death of Jesus, mean that sins could be forgiven? And to be honest, I think we need to dig into that a little bit because it's not really that intuitive when you think about forgiveness just from the standpoint of ordinary people today. I mean, when you think about forgiving somebody, you're generally not thinking about paying a record of debt or cancelling it. You're certainly not thinking about you know, something that costs you or, or that involves blood of some sort. And so the question is, how does the death of Jesus or the blood of Jesus, how does that connect to the forgiveness of sins. And see, in the Bible, forgiveness always comes at a cost. So that's not intuitive to us. We, we don't generally think about forgiveness as costly to us. But in the Bible, forgiveness always comes at a cost. L let me show you a couple of verses that describe this. So Hebrews chapter 9 puts it this way in verse 22. It says, Indeed, under the law... Almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness always comes with a cost. That is why Jesus would say, on the night of the Last Supper, when he broke the bread, and then when he shared the cup, Matthew 26, 28, and when he takes that cup, he says, For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of of sins. Now again, to try and understand this, let's understand why the idea of sacrifice is connected to the idea of forgiveness. And in order to do that, we're going to have to do a really deep dive on the subject of forgiveness in the Bible. 
So you're all ready for this? I would suggest that right about now you push pause and maybe you go grab yourselves a cup of coffee, right? Um, because you can do that because you're at home. So you won't be able to do that when we get back to Rosebank Union Church. So, well, you can, but you'd have to bring me a cup. All right. So when you read in the Bible, when you see the word forgiveness, I mean, that, that comes up about 66 times in the Bible. However, there are about 250 words in the original languages uh, that we then sometimes translate 66 times as forgiveness. So what happened to the other 190 words? And that's where we start to see the range of meaning that is caught up in this word that we then sometimes translate forgiveness. And I want to try to give you an idea of this. And not just because I'm like a Bible nerd, but I really think you're going to see the impact of forgiveness as we, as we understand this. So actually, when we look into it, it gets a little more complicated because there's not just one original word that's translated forgiveness 66 times and in other ways, 190 other times. There's actually four different Greek words in the New Testament that all are translated forgiveness and are translated some other ways. This is getting really quite complicated, isn't it? But, but let me say this to simplify a little bit. Three of those four words are quite similar. And so we can treat them as one. And then there's another word that is all on its own. <laughs> all right, let me get into it. And you'll, you'll see what I'm, what I'm getting at, hopefully, soon. Right, so here are the two words, or, or one which is a group, and, and their range of meanings. So the first one is this Greek word, aphesis. Doesn't even matter if you can say it or spell it, doesn't matter. But the basic idea behind this word and two other related words is to release or to let go or to set free. This idea of liberty is the basic idea behind this word, a thesis, to let go, which is sometimes translated forgive. But it is more often translated let go or release. Let me give you an example of how it is translated not as forgiveness. Uh, for example, Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. All right, you guess it. The word liberty is that word ephesus, which is sometimes also translated forgiveness. But here it is really is this idea, liberty to the captives there, set free. So that's the idea behind that one word, a group of words that is used. Here's the other Greek word that is translated sometimes forgiveness. This one stands all on its own. This is the one in Colossians 2. Uh, so it is the word charisme. You don't have to worry how to say it. I'm probably saying it wrong anyway. Uh, but charisme. And the basic idea behind this word is the idea to grant or to give. It's this idea of generosity. And in fact, the word grace is in there. Charis, charisme, is the word for grace. So it's this idea of abundant giving and generosity, which is sometimes translated to forgive, but otherwise translated in this other way. For example, Romans 8 verse 32 translates it in that way, where it says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And I love that verse. It's just this verse about the abundance of life that we have in Christianity. He, will he not graciously give us all things? Graciously give us is the word charisme, which is also translated forgive in Colossians Two. Right, this may be I promise you this is this is going somewhere. Here's the first question I want to answer related to th that word, the word in our passage. How does the idea of generosity, giving, granting, how does that relate to this idea of forgiveness? Because it is the same word. 
Well, to understand that, we're going to do another thought experiment. Right, so we did a thought experiment uh, last week. That one was a little bit morbid, involving two uh, murderers. This one is a little less intense. All right, so, so think with me here. Let's say that your, your friend, your best friend, needs a car. It's car's in and really desperately needs a car. And you decide to loan your friend your car. But you know that your friend is a bit of a reckless driver. So you load him your car and you're like, hey man, just please, just, I mean, take care of my car. I know you drive, just take care of my car. And friend says, sure, sure, sure. And he takes your car and you guessed it, man, he crashes it and he writes off your car. He's fine, by the way. Let's just make this story good in some way. So he's fine, but he's written off your car. Now, what would it mean for you to forgive him for what he's done. I mean, it was an irresponsible, reckless act. What would it mean for you to forgive him? Well, technically, what it would mean to forgive him would mean to be like, hey, hey man, it's, it's okay. It's just a car. I'm glad you're okay. Like, it, it, I, you can just get another car, right? That's what to forgive would mean. But technically, you go, well, 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 sure, but there's a cost attached to it because you need to replace your car, right? And that's going to cost somebody. Now, if you were going to go to him and say, you know, it's okay, man, but hey, you've got to buy me a new car, I mean, would that be fair? Sure, of course it would be fair. It would be just. He was the irresponsible reckless one but like he's responsible for replacing your car it would be fair but if you were to forgive him then you would have to absorb the cost of that and go man it's okay I uh, forgive you I'm glad you're okay but to do that will cost you because then you have to absorb the debt of that wreck and you have to buy the new car it costs you. That's where the idea of generosity and giving and granting is linked to the idea of forgiveness. Forgiveness always comes with a cost. Always. So I want to show you this idea in the Bible again. And it comes up in, in an amazing way. Uh, and you'll see this in a classic Easter passage. So Acts 3 verse 14 to 16 uh, this is the, Peter uh, speaking before the religious leaders after he's healed that lame beggar and they're kind of challenging him. And Peter speaking to them is sharing the gospel and he says in verse 14, But you denied the holy and righteous one. And this is in the event where uh, uh, the, the governor was going to release a pilot, I don't think he was named pilot, he was going to release either Jesus or Barabbas. And, and Peter's telling a story and says, but you denied the holy and righteous one and you asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And it's quite a bold Jesus standing up, Peter standing up to these religious leaders saying, You denied the author of life. And you asked for a murderer to be released to you. And you killed the author of life. Now listen. When Peter says, you asked for a murderer to be granted to you, to be given to you, Barabbas, when you asked for him to be released, granted to you, guess, guess what word is behind that? You got it. You guys are so smart. I know you're at home. You get, you, you're getting this. That is the word charisma. It's the word forgiven. But you forgave the murderer. He was Granted, you asked for him to be granted to you, but guess what? For Barabbas to be granted, to be forgiven, someone still had to die. He was granted, but the author of life was killed in his place. 
in a way, Barabbas became the very first person whose life was spared because of the death of Jesus. And see, that's the, the word forgiveness. It's there. You might not see it, but it is. That's the word forgiveness. He was forgiven. He was granted. But it cost somebody. It cost Jesus his life. If you think about it, I said it's not intuitive, but in the world today, I mean, we, we know this in some senses. So, for example, in the world of accounting, which let me just, let me just be clear, that is the very first subject that I dropped in high school. I have absolutely no interest in it whatsoever. No offense to all of you accountants out there. But I did uh, had, had a phone conversation with our treasurer uh, yesterday and uh, bounced this off him just to make sure that I sound like I know what I'm talking about. But in the world of accounting, if you have debt, if, if you have, have a debt, but it's bad debt, like you know that the person who owes you just cannot pay it back. Uh, then you can choose to write off that debt. But how do you write off a debt? Like, how do you do that? Well, to write off debt, you have to expense it. So it costs you to write off debt. Listen, Colossians 2, that's exactly why it includes this phrase of by cancelling the record of debt. Today's language that would be writing off the record of debt. But hey, you have to expense that. It costs. That's why it was set aside, nailed to the cross. The price was paid. It was expensed so that the debt could be written off. And that's our debt that was written off. And that's why this is such a powerful picture of forgiveness because we're the ones who couldn't pay back that debt. But we just could not do it. But God, He, through the cross of Jesus, cancelled the record of debt. So that blood and that the transaction was made, it was expensed so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be made alive from dead. Well, I bet you're all just right about now, just pretty stunned. I'm just going to imagine that in my mind, that all of your mouths are hanging wide open as you're stunned about this. Well, I'm pretty stunned about this. Uh, but hey, it, it, it gets even better. It goes further than that. So that's the idea behind this one word, charisme, generosity, and how giving cost is attached to forgiving. Uh, what about that other word? The Ephesus word, the letting go word. How is that attached to the idea of forgiveness? Well, in order to explain that to you, we're going to turn to another fascinating story in the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament, the clearest picture we have in the Old Testament of what Jesus would come to do so the clearest picture of Jesus and the death of Jesus in the Old Testament is clearly the sacrificial system. Right? So that's this elaborate, complex system involving priests, involving a temple, holy of holies, altar, and involving animals who would lose their life. The sacrificial system that was to be a shadow of how God would atone for, pay for, propitiate for sins later through Jesus, right? That whole system in the Old Testament is very clearly a predictor of Jesus. Uh, the whole book of Hebrews uh, goes to great lengths to tell us Jesus is the sacrifice, and he's the altar, and he's the temple, and he's the priest. He's the entire system would be Jesus. So perhaps one of the most important images in the Old Testament is the sacrificial system. Now, central to the sacrificial system is one particular sacrifice that happened on one particular day. It's the most important sacrifice. It happened on a day known as the Day of Atonement, the most solemn of all of the religious festivals. And on this day, the sacrifice was a little different. So 
it would involve four animals. And two of those animals would be sacrificed purely for the priest, right? To atone for, to purify the priest. You couldn't have a priest that was impure offering the sacrifice of atonement that was coming, which again is another predictor to Jesus and why he had to be sinless and why he is that priest. So two animals, a bull and a ram, sacrificed for the priest to make him pure. Then the priest would take two other animals, both of them goats. And this is really important. Two goats were necessary to make up the sacrifice of atonement that would then atone for and purify the entire nation. Two goats, both necessary. And he has what would happen, right? The, piece, the, the priest would cast lots. So something like rolling a dice, which would determine the fate of these two goats. Now, if you were a goat living at this time, this is the one moment in your life where you would be desperate for the roll of the dice to go your way because one of the goats would lose their life and the other goat would be sacrificed. The other goat would be set free, right? So this is like Hunger Games of the Old Testament with goats. So the priest would roll uh, or cast these lots and he would take the goat that was supposed to be sacrificed. And he would sacrifice it as a sin offering, uh, which takes place outside of the Day of Atonement as well for unintentional sins and things like that, never applying to the whole nation. But he would do it this day for the whole nation and he would sacrifice it the way that he would normally do. So spraying the blood on the horns of the altar and on the whole altar and the base of the altar, right? A lot of blood involved because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so there would be that one goat that would be sacrificed. But then the other goat... This would happen. You read this in Leviticus chapter 16. And Aaron the priest shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins. Just picture this. Laying his hands and symbolically transferring all of the sin of the whole nation onto the head of this little goat. And he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all the iniquities on itself to a remote area and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. Okay, so what is the point here? Well, remember, we have two words for forgiveness that we have two goats and i think they relate so the goat that was sacrificed relates to the charisma to the debt that was paid to the cost and the cost is the loss of its life like it was like it cost jesus his life but the other goat the one that was set free well, that is symbolic of the other word for forgiveness, a thesis, which you remember means to let go, which means liberty, freedom, set free. And so you put these two goats together and you have this idea that the debt was paid, it was expensed, so that that debt could be cancelled and... And it was just the sins were not only paid for, but removed, taken, far away from us. That is the meaning of Psalm 103 verse 12. You know this, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our sins from us. Not only were sins paid for, but they were removed, sent away. In other words, these, both these ideas together, the debt being cancelled and set aside, remember Colossians 2, set aside, nailed to the cross, just speaks of one idea, just complete freedom, liberty, made alive from being dead. Isn't that amazing? I've got to be a little bit careful here because I'm getting excited. I know with these cameras and the way that they are set up, I'm not supposed to stand up. But I mean, this is, this is just so exciting. Hey, I want to read you Colossians 2 again and just listen to it. 
with all that's going on in the background now, behind that word forgiveness, listen to it again. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, all the, all the failings of our flesh, you were dead. God made alive together with Jesus by having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he did. This by setting it aside, by nailing it to the cross. Now before we end, we need to take some time to apply this. And it's got to be applied in a way that you're probably not going to like. And that is to remind you that just as we have been forgiven, so we also must forgive others. That's what we pray when we pray the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And all over the New Testament, there is this very clear and hard connection between the forgiveness we receive and the need, the necessity to forgive others. And I know this is a complex subject, forgiving others, and requires us a lot of time. And, we, and hopefully in the future we're going, to have, we're going to have some time to talk about the complexities of forgiveness. But today, here's what we're going to do today. Let's just apply what we already know about forgiveness. Let's apply that, not just to us, but let's apply that to how we will forgive others. So what do we know about forgiveness from today so far? Well, number one, we know that forgiveness is costly. To forgive will cost. To forgive somebody will cost us. Remember, that's what we were celebrating, is that we were forgiven by God, but it cost Him. For us to forgive other people, make no mistake, it's going to cost us. I'm going to use that example, the thought experiment of the friend and the car. And that just leads to a whole subject of, I mean, that really is just and fair. And in that situation, you may need to do that. And it leads to discussion on justice and when is justice right or wrong. But at the very least, we can say this. And while we may not be sometimes looking for justice, sometimes we might. But at the very least, we will not seek vengeance. And I say that because so often we hold on to forgiveness just hold on to unforgiveness, sorry, just out of the sense, this idea that if we hold on to the bitterness and the anger against someone who's hurt us, the root of that is this desire for vengeance to be meted upon them. And at the very least, we have to release our need for vengeance. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And so to forgive means... To absorb ourselves, the debt, absorb it, to not hold it against them. You know, when we desire revenge or vengeance, it's the idea of the of them is payback. And releasing that means just ab absorbing it, just finally, just taking it on and absorbing. Absorbing it on behalf of the others. Now listen, as I'm saying this, I'm like, man, yeah, that's really hard. That's why forgiveness isn't easy. I mean, if it was easy, we would forgive people. But it's not easy. And the reason it's not easy is because it's costly. Because it costs us. It means we have to let go. It's those feelings of anger and bitterness the desire for vengeance and just cancel the record of death against us. Not hold it against others. 
like God did for us. Forgiveness is costly. So to forgive others is going to cost us. That's what we know so far about forgiveness is that it's costly. It's going to cost us. Don't be fooled. It's not going to come easy. We must forgive despite the cost. Secondly, what we know about forgiveness is that we have to let it go, or actually, technically, we have to let them go. We have to, we have to release people from the debt of their mistakes against us. We have to, in a way, just take that hurt, put it on a little goat, and set that goat free. Right, release them. Take that retro record of debt and absorb it, pay for it, and then just set it aside. Release them. That is what forgiveness means. It means releasing them. But can I tell you a secret? Here's a little known secret. When we release those who have hurt us and so offer them a thesis, forgiveness, when we release them, the secret is actually we experience the greatest degree of freedom and liberty and we are released when we release them. See, holding on to bitterness and unforgiveness, I heard somebody say this, it's like setting ourselves on fire and hoping they die on the smoke. It's crazy. We hold on to this bitterness, to this anger and this desire for vengeance. It hurts us. So as we release them, as we do this, as we pay that debt, I mean, it's metaphorical. I don't know what it means, but I know you feel the weight of it. We all need to pray for, pray about what that really means to just absorb the debt what people have incurred against us. And we all need to release people. Just let it go. Let them go. The secret is we will, you will experience the far greater release. And I can guarantee you when you do that, it will be just another version of death to life. And all that weight that you've been carrying will just slip away and it will feel like you are alive once again. I've seen it. I've seen it in my own life. I'm telling you, I tell you guys stories. I have seen it. The moment a person is able to break, just release somebody from intense hurt against them. How it just transforms every part of their lives in a way that we're dead under so much pressure and now made alive. Now listen, I understand that this is not easy. But it can happen. And it will only happen when we are overwhelmed at the forgiveness that we have received in Jesus. Perhaps some good homework. I wish I had time to get into this story today. We really don't. But Matthew 18, verse 21 to 35, Jesus tells a parable about this. An important parable. Just would be great to go and read it. The meaning is quite clear. I don't, I don't have to explain it to you. If we are overwhelmed, grace we've received. And remember last week, the magnitude of debt that we incurred against God transcends any debt someone has incurred against us. And as we just dwell on that, accept that, and as that, the gratitude, as that grows in us, that same grace, as it takes root in our lives, Jerusalem, grace, takes root in our lives and grows it does, it enables us to extend that same grace and forgiveness to others. 
So I'm going to pray now. And, and really, firstly, obviously, I want to pray just for anyone out there who has never experienced the release from knowing that Jesus Christ, through his death, that the record of debt against you is being cancelled. I mean, forget, forget payment holidays, right? In this time, just such a great release for so many people at this difficult time. This is not a payment holiday. This is debt that has been cancelled, paid for, in full. It's a life debt. If you have not experienced that, I want to pray that for you. I want to pray that for everyone else who I just I know this message has got to sink deeper into our lives. Maybe you've never understood forgiveness like this, and may it seep so deep into you. I'm going to pray for that, and then we're also going to pray that God, by His grace through His Spirit, would help us to forgive others. So let's pray. God, I just think today, days in advance of when people will hear this, and I just Think of all the people of Rosebank Union Church and um, as in the series we journey through all these facets, all these aspects of what your cross, what your death on the cross, Lord Jesus, accomplished. And I pray that today this powerful idea of debt being paid and set aside of it being removed from us would bring such release, such freedom, such life to the people listening to this message. I pray especially for those that have never realized this, that have never experienced the release. Jesus, now through your Holy Spirit, would they experience it? Would you work it in their hearts? Would just peace overwhelm them? sense of freedom and joy just bubble out of them even now as they accept what you, Lord Jesus, have done for them and may it transform them, bring them new life. And for those of us that have experienced that, but that have perhaps forgotten that, that this idea has become stale, become too familiar to it, I pray for a mini revival in all of our hearts today that we would re-experience at the very least, a measure of the freedom we have through your sacrifice, Lord Jesus. And God, I pray that by your grace, I don't know how to pray this except to ask that through your Holy Spirit and through the welling up of grace inside of us, that you would even right now enable us to forgive those have hurt us. And I pray, Holy Spirit, you would bring to mind specific cases of unforgiveness to everybody listening, where we're holding on to grudges, big or small. And as I think of those dealing with deep hurts, and as I know just what a long journey this forgiveness can be, I pray that today that journey would start, and at the root of it, would be this experience of our forgiveness from you, a huge debt that was paid for. And may that propel us on a journey towards forgiving others. Some of us, it may be a long journey. But today, would we all help us, Holy Spirit, make a decision to forgive, to cancel the debt, to release those who have hurt us. Would you help us to do this, Holy Spirit? In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey church, I just want to remind you that if anybody needs help this time, we have members of staff that are trying to phone everybody in the church to find out how they're doing in this particular time with Corona. But hey, we're available to talk, to pray with you over the phone, to help you, especially in these difficult journeys of forgiveness. So just reach out to us. There's the prayer portal on the website where you can make prayer requests known. That might be just a way to present any, any help that you need. But we're here ready to love you and help you in this journey. See you next week.
Thanks for joining us for Hashtag Church at Home today. Next week is Easter, and we have some exciting services planned for Good Friday and Easter Sunday. We look forward to celebrating this high point of the Christian calendar together with you.